happy Friday to you. Today is the last day of the first month. Man, this month flew by. You know, there's a saying. I remember my aunt told me when I was young. And I actually, there actually was an article written about this, I think, in the Chicago Tribune years ago. Um, called The Time Quickening Effect of Age. The Time Quickening Effect of Age. Meaning, in simple terms, you will find... The older you get, the more time is going to seem like it flies by. Like when you're young, like say in elementary school or middle school or even high school, that's when time is going to seem like it's moving slow. And mainly because you don't have that many memories. You don't have that many years behind you. The less years you have behind you, the slower time is going to seem to progress. On the flip side, the more years you have behind you, like I give an example. If you're like, say, 12 years old, each year of your life for the next few years is going to seem like it's going by fairly slowly. So let's say your, your starting point was age 12. Every calendar year you experience for, say, the next five years is going to seem like it's going by fairly slowly mainly because you don't have that many memories and that many years behind you. But if you're like 75 years old, each calendar, the next five years, if you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to live another five years, the next five calendar years you experience after your 75th birthday is going to seem like it goes by like that, like that, like that, like that. But yeah, like this month to me, man, just flew by. The month of January of 2020, I mean, it literally seemed like it went. <laughs> I mean, I remember January 1st, like literally like it was two days ago. I remember January 1st, like as if it was like two or three days ago. Matter of fact, I was on a cruise with my girlfriend. Me and my girlfriend went on, were on a cruise to Mexico. We went on a cruise to Mexico. We were on the cruise ship on January 1st. Speaking of cruise ships now, I don't know if y'all heard the story about the, the they, they kept 8,000 people on a cruise ship because of that uh, coronavirus. Every time I hear about a widespread virus, I think of that first episode of The Walking Dead. If any of y'all ever used to watch The Walking Dead, I think of like, zombies and shit when I think of spreading viruses, man. Anyway, happy Friday to you. Um, now, I got a lot of, it's interesting. I got a lot of positive feedback from my last video. I had a, a unexpected moment, as most of you all know, in my last video where my emotions got the best of me. Um, And yeah, it was totally unexpected because, see, some things, that's why some things you just shouldn't talk about. Like, I saw that happen this week on TV a lot to do with the death of Kobe Bryant. A lot of NBA players, like particularly Kyrie Irving, he started crying during an interview after a game. And I could tell he didn't, one like he planned on crying or expected to cry. But just him thinking about his relationship with Kobe Bryant made him start crying. Shaquille O'Neal cried. So a lot of a lot of NBA players been crying on live TV because they've been rem Tracy McGrady was another one because of their relationship with Kobe Bryant. In my last video, I was talking about primarily talking about Kobe Bryant, but he wasn't the one who who made me start crying. I, I started uh, thinking about my father, and um, yeah, I just started thinking about the death of my father, man. And the death of both my parents, man, I, I took both my parents' death really, really hard. Anyway, it was just interesting. A lot, a lot of people were empathetic. Nobody tried to crack no jokes. Like, I've seen people before say stuff like, hey, man, a man's not supposed to cry. That's a woman thing. If you're crying, man, that means you're, you're an emotional beta male. You know, there's this myth that I've heard repeated here on YouTube as well as elsewhere where a lot of people say, 
women are five times more emotional than men are, or just simply women are significantly more emotional than men are. I, I wouldn't 100% agree with that. I wouldn't 100% agree with that. Because, like, I give you a perfect example. I would say men and women are both emotional. They're, in my opinion, there's no one gender that's more emotional than the other gender. Where I would say we're different is that for women as a group, there's exceptions, but as a group, why it seems like women are emotional is because women allow their emotions to dictate a lot of their decisions and particularly their bad decisions. That's why it seems like women are more emotional or have their reputation for being more emotional. I wouldn't say women are more emotional than men, but it's that women many times allow their emotions to dictate their decision making. Whereas men, and there's exceptions, but men as a group, we try to keep our emotions out of our decision making, out of our decision making. But that said, men are highly emotional too. Easy example of that would be sports. You saw Michael Jordan when he cried when he won his first NBA championship. Man, he was crying like a baby, man. He cried uh, his first NBA championship after his father died. He cried. Oh, he laid on the floor, if you remember that. He laid on the floor crying. I've seen a lot of professional athletes, like if they win the Super Bowl or win the NBA Finals or win the World Series or win a boxing match, they'll start crying. You know, those are what's called tears of joy. When you're crying because something good happened, those are called tears of joy. And then the opposite would be I would say there's three types of tears. Most people say two, tears of joy and tears of sadness. I would say there's three types of uh, tears I've seen both men and women have. It's tears of joy when you start crying, your eyes get watery because of something good happened, like you witnessing the, the birth of your first son or daughter. You get married. As I mentioned, if you're a professional athlete or even a college athlete, you win in a championship can cause, like, I'll tell you one time, I start crying because of tears of joy, like some, because of something that good that had happened was um, when I published my first paperback version of Mo One, as everybody know, my hometown is Gary, Indiana, hometown of the Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five. And, um, the main library in Gary decided to, to purchase copies of my Mo One book and they put it in all the branches. There were at the time, a lot of them are closed now, but at the time there was like about seven, six or seven branches of, of the uh, Gary, Indiana Public Library. And they put a copy of my Mo, my 2006 paperback version. And in the main branch, they had it in this glass and case encasement. And they recognized me as a as a Gary, Indiana native who had written a book. And man, when I was a little kid, man, I used to go to the library all the time, man. I, I never dreamed I would have a book, you know, that was highly recognized in a local library. And I remember when the, the head of the library invited me to show me my book in this glass encasement. Man, I ain't gonna lie, I start crying, man. I straight up start crying. So that's one of the only times off the top of my head I can think of when I cried tears of joy. Um, then, of course, there's been multiple times I've had cried tears of sadness. And then I would say the third type of tear that I've seen both men and women exhibit. You ever gotten into a fight with somebody? or just somebody made you really, really mad and you were mad to the point where your eyes start watering, I call those tears of anger. Tears of anger. I've seen both men and women do that. They, 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 they start crying when they're in a state of anger, when they're experiencing the emotion of anger. That's happened to me at least two or three times, if not more, in my life, where I was like angry crying. 
So yeah, I would say those are the three general types of crying. Joyful crying, sad crying, tears of sadness, and angry or frustrated type crying. Um, yeah, that's the third time, if I'm not mistaken, that's the third time I've actually cried on a video, on a YouTube video. I've done it twice on my own channel and once on O'Shea Duke Jackson's channel. Yeah, the first time I remember my emotions got the best of me. Matter of fact, somebody just brought up this, this YouTube uh, video within the last week or two. Where I used to, if you remember, when I first got on YouTube in 2017, at the end of my videos, I would always have a hashtag. I don't do that anymore. But I would always end my videos with hashtag such and such. Hashtag such and such. And uh, one of my videos I did, this is when I first started feeling like a lot of haters and critics were starting to come after me on YouTube. Yeah, that's probably my third, fourth, no more than my fifth month on YouTube. And I was starting to get a lot of haterade. And I did this video where I remember the hashtag was unbreakable. And I started talking about all the adversity that I've experienced in my life. Like when I was in Los Angeles, I was homeless three times. Yep, I was homeless three times. Um, I had long stretches of unemployment when I lived in Los Angeles. And just some other just tough times. Experience. And one of the most, two most notable, I remember, I mentioned that. I had to save myself once from a fire. Most of my longtime listeners and viewers know that. Yeah, one time in 2000, was it summer 2016? I actually saved myself from a fire. I could have been killed in a fire, apartment building fire, if it wasn't because the, the fire people hadn't gotten there yet. So I had to man up and basically save myself. Um, then I that same year, 2016, I had another accident freak accident where I almost lost my right eye. Matter of fact, if you look real close, I have a scar underneath my right eyeball. I almost lost my right eyeball. I came like that close, that close to losing my right eyeball in 2016. And anyway, my, my ending statement was, man, of all the shit I've been through my life, y'all think y'all criticisms and insults is going to break me down? I said, you'll never be able to break me down with criticism and insults because I'm fucking unbreakable. That's, that's kind of, I borrowed that. I have to give proper credit attribution. Michael Jackson had a song called Unbreakable. That was the essence of his, his song by the same title. Michael Jackson, who of course was my favorite singer and entertainer, he had a song called Unbreakable. And it, it was the same, pretty much the same message. He was basically like, because, you know, Michael Jackson, he had a lot of people who loved and adored him, but he had a, he also had a lot of haters. And he did a song where he basically said, man, y'all hater raid ain't going to break me. All the shit I've been through in my life. He was like, y'all can't break me because I'm unbreakable. I'm unbreakable. That, so that was the first video I did where I remember at one point when I was saying that emphatically, I said, I'm unbreakable, motherfuckers. It's a, a tear actually started rolling down my, my, my face because I was getting so emotional and passionate. I more so call that passionate than emotional. I wouldn't say I was getting emotional as much as I would say I was getting passionate. And uh, so that was the first time. Second time I cried on a video was O'Shea Duke Jackson was interviewing me about Bill Cosby when Bill Cosby first, the day he got taken to prison, and man, that, that messed me up, man. I ain't gonna lie, man. That messed me up seeing Bill Cosby. I mean, I, I grew up idolizing Bill Cosby, man. And to see him walking away in handcuffs, going to prison, man, that fucked me up. Man, so while O'Shea was interviewing me, man, that I just lost it, yeah. And so then my last video was the third time um, my emotions took over. So anyway, I appreciated all the condolences I received from my listeners and viewers and a lot of people opened up and shared their stories of of painful losses like the loss of their mother, loss of their father, loss of a brother, loss of a sister, loss of a cousin, loss of a close friend, loss of a neighbor. A lot of people my listeners and viewers, they open up and share with me at least one incident of emotional pain they experienced over somebody dying whether it was an expected death or an unexpected death. And I really appreciated that. I really appreciated 
guys, you know, feeling vulnerable enough to open up to me like that. That that kind of warmed my heart. You know, it really did. You know, I really appreciate that. And I, again, I really appreciate the people who gave me condolences and expressed their empathies and sympathies about the pain they knew that me losing my parents caused me. Okay. Now, on to... Um, now, again, I'm going to say for the millionth time, a lot of stuff I talk about, particularly the free YouTube portion, um, is sometimes inspired or influenced by something one of my followers sent me, like a link to a podcast, a link to a live stream, whatever. And um, I heard somebody on this live stream talking about... See, there's so many people I hear on YouTube. And I want to pick on black men, but it ain't just, I know it's not just exclusive black men, because I know white men, I'm sure, do it too. Asian men, I'm sure, do it too. Uh, Hispanic men, I'm sure, in their own right, do it too. But you have so many men who make these blanket statements, these highly invalid blanket statements that just blow my mind. That just blow my mind. Well, I'm going to talk about two things. One real quick and one a little longer. First, I want to talk about just, and you know I've talked about this before. I've talked about this before. Is the issue of credibility. Credibility. I notice a lot of, I hate to generalize, but a lot of young people, and I've had young people even admit this, so I know this is not just my own opinion as an older man, because I've had young guys who have admitted this and confessed this about their own generation. So I'm a loosely generalized. I'm a loosely generalized. But a lot of you young guys, man, y'all don't pay attention to people's credibility, man. And then, like, for me, the way I am, that, like, blows my mind. That like blows my mind that a lot of you young guys, y'all will listen to people giving opinions on certain subject matter and even more so offering advice on certain subjects. And those people don't really have the credibility to be offering that opinion or offering that advice. I did a whole video podcast last year about that, about the significant lack of credibility on YouTube particularly among people giving like dating and relationships advice. I would say probably like three-fourths or more of the people on YouTube giving, offering attraction and seduction advice or dating and relationship advice, they don't have the credibility to be doing it. But yet they have a lot of people listening to them. Sometimes, quite frankly, more than me. And that blows my mind. What does it mean to have credibility? If I wrote a book called How to Maintain a Successful Marriage, but in reality, I've never been married, not even one time, I could, in that book, I could actually be offering some reasonably valid advice. But the fact remains, I don't have the credibility to write that book. Even if some of my, some portions of my advice might be worthwhile advice, I don't have the credibility to write that book. See, I know a lot of people on, on social media and YouTube criticize various factions of mainstream media, but one compliment I give mainstream media, and I've given this compliment before, most factions of mainstream media, not all, but most, they're going to scrutinize you. Before they interview you for a newspaper article, a magazine article, a broadcast radio article, or a TV, television appearance, they're going to make sure you have the credibility to, to know what you're talking about. And that's, that's one of the first things they're going to they're gonna check on you, man, is your credibility. If you, don't have any, if you don't have the adequate amount of credibility, you ain't going to be featured in no major newspaper. You ain't going to be featured in no major magazine. You ain't going to be a, a guest on no major broadcast radio show. You ain't going to be no guest on no local, regional, or national television show. People got to know that you have credibility, man. See, YouTube don't have no kind of um, vetting process like that. 
YouTube, you, you can be just a bum off the streets. And if you got a webcam and a YouTube channel, you can get on YouTube and just start giving people advice about life and call yourself a life coach, even though just a few weeks ago you were a bum on the street. I wouldn't have the credibility to write a book called How to Maintain a Successful Marriage because I've never been married. I wouldn't have the credibility to write a book called How to Become a New York Times Best-Selling Book Author because I've never been. I, I, I have yet to be, even though that's one of my goals, but I have yet to be a New York Times Best-Selling Book Author. So I wouldn't have the credibility to write that book. So I'm going to touch briefly on credibility and then more so on some of the blanket statements that guys make that are invalid. Credibility. I heard a guy, one of my followers sent me a link of this guy, young guy. And he was, <laughs> it was a funny thing, man. He was doing a live stream and he was giving advice on how to score a threesome with two women. He was giving advice on how to score a threesome with two women. But then somebody asked him in his chat room, how many threesomes have you had in your life? And you just knew he was going to say like 10, 15, 20. He said one. He said one. Guy was giving advice on how to score a threesome. And he only had one threesome in his, in his entire adult life. How does this dude have the credibility to be giving guys advice on scoring a threesome when he's only had one threesome? I'm sorry, man. That ain't enough. One threesome is enough to qualify you to be giving people advice. But yet his chat room was full, though. He had a lot of guys, quite a few guys in his chat room. And they, I, I'm assuming they were listening to everything he said. But the dude only had one, it's admitted during the live stream that he only had one sexual threesome. I think he was, he looked like he, I don't know his age. He looked like he was in his early to mid thirties. And he said he had one threesome, but yet he was acting like he was this super knowledgeable advisor on how to score threesomes. Man, I've had more threesomes than that in a month. And he, this dude talking about one threesome in his whole life. I want to say I've had a minimum of two threesomes in one week before. Matter of fact, I know I have. Yeah, in one week before when I was in my 20s, I had I had multiple threesomes in a, over the course of a week. Definitely over the course of a month and even more so over the course of a year. I've had, man, like dozens of threesomes in my life, starting with the age of like late teens, early 20s. I've had multiple threesomes. Y'all saw a video? Well, they all didn't see everything, but I was with two women on a video that, that my Patreon subscribers, a BDSM video I did where I was with two women at the same time, man. Damn, man, I mean, come on, man. One threesome and you on here giving advice? You don't have a credit. That person, again, my opinion, if the person got subscribers, listeners, viewers, supporters, more power to them. But I don't get that. I'm almost more critical of the guys who are following this guy than I am the guy himself. Because it ain't like he's forcing these people to follow him. I'm more critical of the people who follow him. Why are you following somebody who does not really have the credibility to give you the advice on whatever it is they're giving you advice on. Like, I've talked about this before. I've heard guys on YouTube advising other men to basically stop dating women seriously. They'll say stuff like, don't marry women, don't get into a long-term relationship with a woman, but yet they in a long-term relationship with a woman or they're married to a woman. Why are you listening to that person? They have no credibility. I know a popular podcast, I ain't going to say his name, but most people going to know who I'm talking about. I know a popular black male 
podcaster that essentially be discouraging black men from dating and marrying black women, but yet he'd been in a long-term relationship with a black woman for over 10 years. Over 10 years, he'd been in a relationship with a black woman, but yet he'd be discouraging other black men from dating black women. He even calls himself SYSBM, but he's in a relationship with a black woman. If he's in a relationship with a black woman, who is he saving himself from? See, this is the stupid shit I'm talking about, man. You got guys on here giving advice on how to go through a divorce that's never been divorced. You got people giving advice on how to raise kids that don't have any kids. You got people giving advice on YouTube how to become a millionaire. They ain't even remotely close to being a millionaire themselves. What the fuck, man? You might as well have gay men on YouTube giving advice on how to seduce women. That's how ridiculous YouTube has gotten. You might as well. You might as well have gay men on YouTube, and I'm sure there is some. I'd be willing to bet you money that there's at least a handful of gay men on YouTube giving advice to other men on how to seduce, attract and seduce women, even though they're gay. That's how ridiculous YouTube is because there's no, there's no credibility checks, man. I mean, like, y'all remember, I went off on one video either last year or 2018 where I heard this black male podcast is talking about emphasizing being real, being authentic, being real, being authentic. But this black male podcast and a YouTube person that never shows his face and doesn't use his real name. But yet he's talking about being real. You know what I want to say. N-word, please. Ain't nobody real to me who ain't using their real face and real name. I use my real face and my real birth certificate name. Do you? If you're a YouTube personality, do you? If you, if the answer is no, shut the fuck up. Don't ever preach to me about being real or authentic, ever. Real talk. Don't ever preach to me about no, no being real or being authentic. And you don't use your real face and or your real name. Man, please, spare me. You fraud. You're a fraud. That's what you are. You're a fraud. Like there's another dating coach. I ain't gonna say the name of y'all gonna know who I'm talking about. Very popular dating coach. People, he got thousands of people follow him. They don't know his first his real first name or his real last name. They don't know what high school he, he went to. They don't know what city he grew up in. Nothing. They don't know nothing about this dude. But y'all, y'all hanging on to every word he say. I'm sure y'all can tell that agitates me a bit. Hell yeah, it does, man. Got all these people on YouTube, man, giving advice. It ain't just in relation to daily relations. I've heard people on YouTube giving advice in all areas of life. Finances, health and fitness. And they don't even have no credibility. You got dudes who like 100 pounds overweight giving health and fitness advice on YouTube. Anyway, one of the things I was listening to was a guy making this blank statement. I've heard quite a few guys make this statement that women today are undateable and unmarriageable. Women today are undateable and unmarriageable. Says who? Says who? Says who? Have marriage rates in the United States and other countries declined to one degree or another? Yes, they have. But here's the, here's the simple fact. People still get married. There might be less people getting married but people are still getting married. People are still getting married. Men and women are still getting involved in long-term relationships. I'm in a long-term relationship myself. I consider my girlfriend very dateable. So how can anybody say women in today's society are not dateable? I, in, in fairness to men, I hear women say it. 
I hear women say men aren't dateable. You don't have any good men anymore. I hear men saying you don't have any good women anymore. And I hear men, women saying you don't have any good men. What the fuck is that? Really? Seriously? What is a good man and a good woman? I wrote an article in the Negro Ministry about that. I wrote an article about that, the myth of the good man and good woman. What I basically argue in my article is that the term good man or good woman is highly subjective. There's no universal definition of a good man or a good woman. I mean, seriously, there isn't. There, if, if I'm wrong, prove me wrong. There's no universal, objective consensusly agreed upon definition of a good man or a good woman. If you asked a hundred men, what's their, what's the criteria for an ideal wife, an ideal fiance, or an ideal long-term girlfriend, I guarantee you that you would get a wide variety of different responses. I wrote an article about that too. I wrote an article about asking men what specific personality traits and behavioral traits are important to you. Because and it ranges from, 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 from man to man. It ranges. What we want out of a woman, whether it be for casual sex, a long-term romantic relationship, or marriage, is going to generally range from man to man. It ain't going to never be universally the same. There's something, there's a couple of traits that do come close to being almost universal, but there's other traits that are nowhere near being it. The two, I would say the two traits that come close to being universal when somebody's looking for a long-term partner and or a spouse, number one is honesty, which of course is what my books are about. That's what my books are about. Honesty. That's probably the closest thing that comes the closest to people's criteria for an ideal long-term partner or spouse is honesty. Most men, when they talk about some the, the type of behavior they want in a long-term girlfriend or fiance or wife, the first thing they usually want her to be is honest. They don't want to be in a relationship with a liar. I say that in my book, Possibly of Sex, in chapter nine. I say, what's the point of being in a relationship with a person or marriage in a person, if, if the person you're in a relationship with is a liar. But there's exceptions to that. Like, I know some women who have told me, women that I know in real life personally, that have told me, like, I know one woman particularly, she's married to a frat brother of mine. And this frat brother of mine she's married to, he's cheated on her multiple times. And, you know, lied about it, you know, until he got caught. And she, we, me and her were talking one time at this party. And she was saying that a lot of her girlfriends would always ask her, why are you still with so-and-so when he's always lying to you? And, and she said, there's other things more important to me than 100% honesty. And I just went, hmm. <laughs> I went, hmm. I wonder what those things are. Yeah, she, she said honesty wasn't the most important thing to her. I've had a few women, at least a dozen women over the course of my adult life that have told me that honesty wasn't the number one thing that was key to them. But exceptions aside, I would say that's probably the one thing that most people look for in a long-term partner or a spouse is honesty. Along with honesty, they kind of first cousins to each other would be loyalty. Loyalty. Now, those two aren't exactly synonymous. A woman could be honest without necessarily being loyal. Some people think honest and loyal are the same thing. For a perfect example, that would be like a polyamorous relationship or an open relationship. When you're when somebody's uh, in, a, in a polyamorous relationship or open relationship, they're usually going to be honest, but they're not going to be loyal or faithfully monogamous. Speaking of that, I've had a few people in my comment section, not too many, just a handful, ask me, they say, Alan, I've heard you always distinguish between a polyamorous relationship and an open relationship. I thought those two were the same thing. What's the difference? Well, 
if you go to CNN, CNN.com actually just had an article within the last week about polyamory. And one of the guys they were interviewing in that article, he pointed out the difference between being in a polyamorous relationship and being in an open relationship. A lot of people think those are one and the same, but they're, they're actually, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. Without getting too lengthy, too detailed, here's the simple difference. Polyamorous relationship means that you're in a long-term romantic relationship with somebody or you're married to somebody and you have the freedom to have sex, to take on an additional lover, to maintain an additional lover. Like, so if you're a, a man who's married, engaged to be married, or you got a long-term girlfriend, but you have the freedom to maintain an additional, so some other lover in addition to your wife, fiance, or girlfriend, that would be polyamorous. But the catch is you... It, it, you cannot take on an additional lover without the consent and approval of your partner or spouse. You have to run it by them first. Yeah, they have to basically offer their consent and approval. That's a polyamorous relationship. Open relationship would be if you're married, engaged to be married, or in a long-term romantic relationship, and you just got a total green light to fuck anybody you want to, whenever you want to, without running it past your wife, husband, fiance, or long-term girlfriend, long-term boyfriend. You can just go out and fuck whoever you want to without sharing the details of that sexual interaction with your partner or spouse. That's an open relationship. So like right now, for example, my relationship with my girlfriend is polyamorous. As of today, I've never had sex with anybody other than her. She hasn't had sex with anybody other than me. But we do have the freedom if we if we wanted to have an additional lover. We haven't chosen to yet. But let's say I wanted to take on a second lover in addition to my girlfriend. I would let my girlfriend know. I would say, hey, there's this woman I'm interested in having sex with. What are your thoughts? Would that neg Do you think that would negatively affect our relationship? And so on and so on. You talk it. You discuss it. That's a truly polyamorous relationship. Whereas, again, an open relationship is if me and my girlfriend were in a relationship as we are now, and she was free to just go out on a Friday or Saturday night and meet a guy in a club and fuck him without letting me know, or I was free to just go to the club and meet a woman and fuck her and not let her know, that's open. So there's a difference between polyamorous and, uh, and open. But speaking of having multiple partners, like I've heard some men say, well, Alan, I think if a woman has had sex with X number of men, she's undateable and unmarriageable. And that that is ranged from man to man. Like some men will say, if a woman has had more than 25 partners, she's unmarriageable or undateable. Other men say if she has more than 15 partners. I've heard some men say, if a woman has more than three partners, and I'm not even joking. I've had some men say, if a woman has more than three sex partners in her life, she's undateable and unmarriageable. Says who? Says you? Now, in, in those guys' defense, there's nothing wrong with you having your own personal standards and personal criteria for what you consider to be an ideal long-term girlfriend, an ideal fiance, or ideal wife. So if that means if a woman's had five male sex partners and you only want a long-term girlfriend or wife who's had three sex partners or less, then there's nothing wrong with you having your standards. So I'm not criticizing men for having their own standards. But what I have a problem with is when you try to project your criteria and your standards to all men, to all men, then yeah, I, I'm I'm gonna shred you to pieces intellectually. I'm gonna shred you to pieces because you're full of shit. You're living in a delusional fantasy world is what you're doing. That's what you're doing if you try to project it to all men. You're living in a delusional fantasy world. There's porno stars that are married. There's women that are strippers who are married. There's women, I know women who've had over 250 sex partners in their life that are married. I would say I know women who've had... uh 
over a thousand male sex partners in their life that are married. Yes. And I'm not just exclusively talking about porn stars. Different men have different criteria, man. Different men have different criteria. Like I've heard men say if a woman has had sex with a guy within 24 hours after meeting him, she ain't marriage material. Says who? Is that your criteria? Or are you trying to project your criteria to all men? And again, in fairness to, to men, I want to be fair and objective. Women, I've heard women make the same type of statements. Like if a man, like I've heard women, theirs is rarely usually related to promiscuity. Women's criteria, one of women's criteria is usually related to stuff to do with the man's level of career success, financial success, and education. Like I've heard women say, if a man don't have a, a college degree, he's undateable, unmarriageable. Says who? That's, that might be your criteria. If that's your criteria, I ain't going to criticize. But if you're trying to project that criteria on to all women, then I'm going to shred you to pieces because that's bullshit. Matter of fact, I have, a, I have a female cousin who has that criteria. She told me, I remember years ago, she told me she would never marry a guy who didn't have a, a professional graduate degree, like a medical degree, a law degree. Sure enough, her husband of 25 years, he has a law degree. But she had told me even before she married her husband, she had told me, she said, when she was like in her late teens, early 20s, she said, I will never marry a man unless he has not only a college degree, but he has to have a professional degree. And she held on to that, that standard. But she didn't try to project that standard to all her female friends. But that was her own personal standard. But yeah, I've heard women say if a guy ain't making at least 50 grand a year, he's unmarriageable. I know men who make only minimum wage that are married. Real talk. I've known men over the course of my life who had minimum wage jobs who were married. Being really shallow and superficial, I've even had a handful of women say, if a guy don't have a, a certain size penis, if his penis is not this size or this thickness, this length or this thickness, then he's, he's, he's undateable, unfuckable, and unmarriageable. If that's your own criteria, more power to you. But my, again, my problem when you talk about certain behavioral traits, certain personality traits, stuff to do with personal sexual past, if you're speaking for yourself and only yourself, I don't have no issue with you. But when you're trying to project your standards and criteria onto other people, that's when, number one, I have a problem with you. And if me and you were to get into a debate, I would shred you to pieces. I guarantee you I will. Like, I've heard some men, they'll say, I've heard men say stuff like, no man wants to marry a fat woman, a woman who's significantly overweight. Well, then how come there are significantly overweight women who are married? Dude, I know literally hundreds, if not thousands of women who are a minimum of 50 pounds overweight, in some cases over 100 pounds overweight, that are married. And on the flip side, I know some women who have never been fat in their life. Women who, from the time they were like 15 years old, have had a slender body that have never been married even one time. Even one time. How do you explain that? Particularly you guys who say stuff like, women who are fat are, are unmarriageable. How come I know just as many, if not more, women who are fat, who have been married for 10 years, 15 years, 20 plus years, but yet you got other women who got these slender, even shapely bodies that haven't been married even once. Look at Halle Berry. Halle Berry was considered one of the most beautiful black women in society. Now she's been married, but she's been divorced like what, three, four times? How come she can't stay married? And she's so beautiful. So that just lets you know that being good looking don't guarantee that you're going to either get married in some cases, or if you do get married, that you're going to stay married. There are a lot of beautiful actresses and beautiful female celebrities I can think of that have either never been married or if they've been married, they've been divorced like two or more times. So y'all y'all be killing me with this, these blanket statements saying, if a woman has done this or if a woman has this personality trait or this characteristic, she's undateable, unmarriageable. Again, speak for yourself. That's all I'm saying. 
If you're speaking for yourself, I ain't got no issue with you. But if you're trying to project your criteria to other people's criteria, to all men, and make all men feel like they should think this exact same way you do, you're full of shit because you, you can't substantiate that with anything factual. Again, if you're trying to say if a woman has a highly promiscuous past, she's undateable and marriageable, says who? I know a lot of women with promiscuous past that are married. I know many women that I went to high school. And matter of fact, I talked about this on a video before. I know, believe it or not, I know more women that I went to high school and college with that had, that had a reputation for being promiscuous that are now married and been married for a minimum of 15 years than, than a lot of the quote unquote good girls. A lot of women I went to at, with high school and college with that were had reputation for being, you know, really prudish, monogamy oriented, good girl types. Do you know at least half of those women haven't been married not even one time? Me and my two of my frat brothers were talking about this uh, a year or two ago. We talk about it like once every three or four years we'll talk about that. Yeah, a lot of women that I've known that I went to either high school with and or college with that were known as good girls, I'd say at least 40 to 50% of those women, they've never been married even one time. They haven't been married one time. Whereas a lot of other women I know who used to be known as sluts and hoes and kinky freaks and all that type of stuff, they had some kind of label attached to them. A lot of those women, man, they've been married for like 15, 20, 25 years, got two or three kids, got a devoted husband, living in a real big house. Like I know a woman right now as I speak, she lives in Indianapolis. She married, I want to say a doctor, lives in a beautiful home, beautiful home. This woman was a, a she was promiscuous as hell when we was in college together. She was hella promiscuous. Like, I'm talking about, like, probably, like, at least two dozen of my frat brothers fucked her when we was in college. She was just giving the pussy out like, like it was free government cheese. But yet, right now, as I speak, she is married to a doctor who makes a lot of money. She lives in, like, this house that looks like a mansion. She drives, like, a Mercedes and a, a Jaguar. And, I mean, she's living a life. Now, being real, her husband didn't go to college with us, so he probably, realistically, I would say 90% chance he probably doesn't know all the details of her sexual past. But the fact remains, she got a husband. And has had him for like over 20 years. And then on the flip side, I know women, again, who were known as being virgins or next to virgins and known as being prudes and, you know, good girls, the type of woman that didn't engage in casual sex at all while she was in college. A lot of those women, man, they've never been married. They now in their 40s and 50s haven't been married one time. They haven't been married one time. So for any guy to say that if a woman is promiscuous, has a promiscuous past, she's undateable, unmarriageable, you talking shit. You talking out your ass. You can't back that up with facts. You can't back that up with facts. Drops money. In my Patreon exclusive portion, I'm going to talk about the related to my, this is kind of going to be related to my very last Patreon exclusive video, but I'm going to talk about the number one weakness of the proverbial nice guy. The number one weakness of the proverbial nice guy. Your polite, well-mannered nice guy. Why? What's his, not more than anything else, what's his like single most significant weakness? I'm talking about that in my Patreon exclusive portion.